Well, today we're looking at Darwin, Hitler, and the modern devaluation of human life. And, and Richard, Richard Weikart, you're a professor of modern European history at the California State University, and you're a senior fellow at Discovery Institute Center for Science and Culture. You've written about six books, and you've particularly published on areas of evolutionary ethics, uh, eugenics, social Darwinism, euthanasia, and scientific racism. That's a fascinating combination of things. Perhaps we could just start off by asking you, what are the features of Darwinian theory that devalue human life? Well, there are actually several elements of Darwinism that devalue human life. And I'm speaking here as a historian. I'm not, it's not that I made up these uh, traits. It's that Darwinists themselves claim that these features of Darwinian theory mean that human life is not uh, as valuable. And so uh, in the 19th century, Darwin was trying to uh, minimize the distinction between humans and animals and claim that there was no qualitative distinction between humans and animals. And this idea in itself was going to have pretty powerful implications for the value of human life. And if we jump to today, there are thinkers such as Peter Singer uh, and others, a famous bioethicist at Princeton University, uh, who argues that because there's not a significant qualitative distinction between humans and animals, that that means euthanasia and infanticide and abortion are permissible. And so this is one element. There also are other elements within Darwinian theory besides just this distinction between humans and minimizing the distinction between humans and animals. For example, the uh, struggle for existence between humans. That is that humans are in this competition to the death ultimately uh, with over-reproduction and the Malthusian population principle, the over-reproduction uh, that can't sustain the population. So death is sort of built into the theory and in fact death becomes a positive thing in Darwinian theory because you have, in order to get lots of variation you have to have lots of prolific reproduction but with all that variation in the prolific reproduction, then there has to be mass death. And so you have death on a grand scale built into the Darwinian theory and bringing about what's supposedly evolutionary progress and supposedly something good. Mm. And population control has been linked to the so-called culture of death, hasn't it? Euthanasia, infanticide, and abortion. Uh, how have Darwin-inspired thinkers contributed to the culture of death that we're seeing growing around the world? Well, if you look back at the origins of uh, movements for euthanasia, for example, or also abortion too, but euthanasia in particular, what you'll find is that Darwinian thinkers were the first people to actually begin promoting euthanasia. Mm -hmm. In the German scene where I've done most of my research, Ernst Haeckel, who was the leading German Darwinian biologist in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, was the first scholar in Germany to promote euthanasia, that is killing of people with disabilities. Uh, and he did it on his premises that uh, these people were not fit in a Darwinian kind mm -hmm. of sense, and so we should just help them help nature along uh, by eliminating them. Uh, if you look in the British scene also, in Britain in the 18th, late 1860s, also the first proponents of euthanasia were also people who were coming from a, a very forthright Darwinian perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you track the euthanasia movement after that, you find that the same thing is happening. Ian Dowbiggin, who's one of the leading historians of the American euthanasia movement, uh, has said very forthrightly that uh, one of the biggest uh, impacts on the euthan early euthanasia movement was the coming of Darwinism to America. Mm -hmm. So this whole idea of the non-survival of the weakest becoming a public duty, almost, that something that we should be doing. Yes, exactly, and they, they saw that as a sort of a social application of Darwinian theory. Mm. And how does worldview impact this? It's, it's uh, been said that, that atheism and agnosticism, because of their different anthropology, uh, can have a tendency to devalue human life. Do you, do you agree with that, and, and how would you see that? Yes, I do. Out? Yes, I do agree with that, and it's, it's sort of these, all these worldview issues are sort of working together. Darwinism, also the naturalistic perspective that Darwinism was reinforcing in the late 19th century. So the atheistic and agnostic perspectives, ultimately what they were saying, and what Darwin was also uh, helping to underline, was that humans are simply the product of naturalistic processes and ultimately accidental processes, so that we're just a cosmic accident, mm -hmm. so that humans are not planned, there's no teleology, there's no purpose and meaning to human existence. Uh, we're just an accidental chance event that, that happened along the way. And so once you buy into that kind of an idea that humans are just an accidental process of this of an impersonal universe, uh, 
then it's hard to see how human life would have any kind of value. Although I should say at the same time that one of the things I do in my book, Death of Humanity, is I try to show that most atheists and agnostics and other secular thinkers are not totally consistent with that because at some level they do know that human life has value. Mm. It's, it's often said that you can't derive an ought from an is or, or get morality out of a worldview. But it, you seem to be suggesting that, that Darwinian theory and, and the whole idea of biological determinism, that, that we're just the product of matter, chance and time in a godless universe, have actually become a worldview that started to shape morality. Could, could, could you sketch out the process by which that's happened for us and perhaps some of the key names involved in it? Yes, well, the way that happened in a big way in the 19th century was actually through Darwinian theory. And if, if you actually look at a lot of even contemporary thinkers today when they talk about uh, the origins of morality, they will usually try to give some kind of evolutionary explanation for it one way or another. Mm -hmm. And so Darwin does play a key role here. And what Darwin uh, believed was that uh, ethics had evolved just like other kinds of traits, biological traits, and he thought they were biologically ingrained, at least to some degree. Mm -hmm. And he called these social instincts that he thought had developed among humans. And he thought mm -hmm. that this had happened basically because certain humans who had cooperative instincts, uh, these social instincts, would be able to outcompete maybe the neighboring tribe uh, and be able to either uh, do better at uh, gathering food or better in warfare because they were working together rather and be cooperative rather than competing among themselves within their group. So this is sort of the way that he uh, explained the origins of morality. But what's interesting too, and Darwin recognized this, he actually mentions this in his autobiography, is that once you come up with that kind of construct for the origins of ethics, what that means is that ethics and morality are are changing over time. They're not fixed, uh, and they can be different from one from one race to the other. Because mm -hmm. Darwin is, and a lot of the, in the 19th century uh, biologists, many of them thought that the races were unequal biologically, mm -hmm. uh, and they thought that they were unequal even in their moral instincts as well. So you could even have differences morally between different races. So there's no one kind of morality. In other words, it's not universal. It's not objective either. It's just based on these subjective instincts that we might have. Uh, and so this was a pretty radical transformation of thinking about uh, ethics uh, through the advent of Darwinian theory. And Darwin himself played a pretty key role in that because he, he spent a lot of time in The Descent of Man, published in 1871, mm -hmm. 12 years after his Origin of Species, where he discusses the evolution of morality. Mm -hmm. And to what degree have these ideas become disseminated and, and, and picked up by people you know, perhaps who are morally driven by other worldviews. Yeah, what's interesting is that uh, when you talk about, <laughs> use this word like morally driven, a lot of people uh, today, a lot of secular thinkers today, will uh, appeal to evolution as the origin of morality. In fact, I've, I've seen this a lot of cases too, I've met for when I've seen the Christian apologists, uh, like William Lane Craig one time came to the mm -hmm. University of Iowa when I was a graduate student there mm -hmm. and gave a talk about uh, the moral argument for the existence of God. And the, the secularists in the audience, their chief opposition to that was evolutionary ethics, that, that morality has evolved. And so we have another way of explaining where this morality came from. It didn't come from God. It came from you know, evolutionary processes, natural, completely naturalistic processes. And so it has disseminated pretty widely, these ideas. Uh, but the, on the other hand, many of these secular thinkers will say, well, even though it's originated in that way and may be subjective in certain ways, because it's biologically ingrained, we still are morally driven. We still have these moral instincts. And so we're not necessarily going to do bad things to others. I mean, Michael Roos, who's a very prominent philosopher of science, in fact, has argued that very forthrightly that, you know, because we have these biologically inherent uh, instincts that uh, cause him. In fact, he, there's a famous saying of him and E.O. Wilson in an article where they said that uh, ethics is an illusion fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. And yet they believe that there is this cooperative instinct in us, so they think, that's how we'll tend to act. Now, I, I wish they would you know, read the newspaper or uh, you know, the world news and such and find out that people don't always cooperate in that way. In other words, mm -hmm. evolution doesn't give you any way to distinguish between you know, Hitler's or Genghis Khan's ethics and the ethics of um, you know, Mahatma Gandhi or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all the same. They're all just a natural, uh, natural product of uh, chance processes. Yeah. Now, the, the, there's a relationship between uh, what we know as the eugenics movement, which was, was uh, well established in many different countries apart from Germany before 
the Second World War and, and Nazi ideology and, and later acceptance of, of euthanasia uh, as well. How did evolutionary ethics contribute to these, these movements that we've seen over the last century? Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly, in the late 19th century, there were actually two different kind of formulations of evolutionary ethics. One that I've already discussed is the, uh, the, evolution, the evolutionary origins of ethics. That's one kind of way that people thought of evolutionary ethics. But there actually was a second way, uh, and this second way was the notion that what is moral is what promotes evolutionary progress, mm -hmm. which there's kind of a a contradiction here because it actually implies some kind of teleology. It implies there's something toward which things are moving if you're talking about progress. But nonetheless, a lot of evolutionists, including Darwin himself, were contradictory in that very way. In fact, Darwin actually recognized the contradiction. Darwin in his notebooks wrote that he should never refer to animals as higher or lower. But then you read Origin of Species and he does constantly refer to <laughs> species as higher and lower. Uh, so, these, uh, so this notion of evolutionary ethics as you know, promoting evolutionary progress, and that's how you determine what's moral, this was going to become a very powerful idea, and that's what was going to drive people in the eugenics movement, which was a movement to try to improve human heredity. Mm -hmm. And so they thought that we need to you know, use artificial selection to sort of help evolution along, mm -hmm. you know, to Im improve the human species and bring about biological progress. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, that idea was going to drive some to a more, even a more radical position, which was to use killing, not just... Yeah. Uh, not just controlling reproduction. I mean, the, the, a lot of people in the eugenics movement wanted to use marriage restrictions, yeah. uh, compulsory sterilization. Those are some of the popular ideas in the eugenics movement. But then some went more radical and said we should even kill uh, to eliminate people mm -hmm. that were considered genetic defects. These ideas were going to be core ideas in Nazi ideology, mm -hmm. and they were going to be some of those radical practitioners of that, passing compulsory sterilization law and sterilizing one out of every 200 Germans were compulsorily sterilized mm. under the Nazi regime mm. during that time. And then they began killing people with disabilities mm. uh, in early 1940, well, 1939, actually, uh, to try to drive. And, and they saw as their uh, goal to improve the human species. Mm. Well, the eugenics movement was quite active in America and in uh, Britain and in mm -hmm. Scandinavia as well. What, why didn't it progress in quite the same way that it did in Nazi Germany? Well, I think, think there's a number of reasons why that didn't happen. <clears throat> um, for one thing, actually, in terms of compulsory sterilization laws, the United States actually was the first mm -hmm. to have compulsory sterilization laws. In 1907, the state of Indiana passed a compulsory sterilization law. So they were sort of uh, path-breaking in that respect. Uh, and then a, quite a number, over half the states in the United States did pass compulsory sterilization laws. They didn't practice it as radically, though, as the Nazis we're going to later on. And part of the reason is because they got pushback, uh, especially from the Catholic Church, but also from conservative Protestants mm. uh, in the early 20th century. Interestingly, the liberal Protestants generally were pushing, were promoting eugenics. Uh, there's actually a book out called Preaching Eugenics that talks about how a lot of uh, more main, uh, mainline, uh, mainline denominations, pastors were actually promoting eugenics uh, and such. So I think part of it was there's just more pushback from some of the more conservative elements in those places. But there still was a pretty strong eugenics movement in the United States and in Britain. Britain never had compulsory sterilization, but uh, they had a strong eugenics movement uh, there as well as in other parts. Den Scandinavia, interestingly, did have uh, Denmark and Sweden had compulsory sterilization laws mm -hmm. as well. It was considered a progressive cause at the time. Mm -hmm. well, what was the role of philosophy in all this? It's, it's often said that, that what, what gets whispered in University Ivory, ivory Towers and one generation gets shouted in the streets in the next. And, and I've heard there's a connection between Nietzsche and, and uh, Hitler. Uh, how was Hitler and Nazi ideology influenced by Nietzsche's thinking specifically? Yeah, Nietzsche is coming from a quite different angle, of course, than Darwin in a lot of different ways. And, and, and Nietzsche is very anti-scientific in a lot mm. of his kinds of thought. However, interestingly, uh, the Nazis were going to draw on a fund of ideas from a variety of ways. Hitler was, uh, you know, drew on a lot of different uh, kinds of philosophies, ideologies, and the past. And it's not clear that Hitler ac himself actually was all that heavily influenced by Nietzsche fairly early on in his career, but later on he did 
uh, draw the connections, and he himself uh, funded the Nietzsche archive in Weimar out of his own personal funds. Mm -hmm. uh, he visited there, wanted to be associated with it. And, but the way that Nietzsche connected with the Nazi ideology in particular, even though there were certain parts of Nietzsche's philosophy that would have been contrary to Nazi ideology, which by the way was also true about a lot of other movements that picked up on Nietzsche. The feminist movement, for example, uh, was very, uh, very pro, very interested in Nietzsche, despite the fact that Nietzsche was a misogynist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the feminist movement still loved Nietzsche because he sort of hit at their enemies. The, he tore down the church and traditional ideas and things like that. Okay. So what was, what was important for Nietzsche and the Nazis was that uh, Nietzsche was very opposed to the Christian uh, teachings about compassion for the weak mm. and helping the sick, helping the poor. Uh, he was wanting to promote a, a morality of the strong. And he actually, he used, he actually said forthrightly, Nietzsche did, that uh, the strong, the so-called Ubermensch or Superman figures should oppress and dominate the mm. weak. And so this- Have a duty to do it. Almost. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 Although I don't know if you'd use the word duty because again, <laughs> that implies the moral obligation and mm. he's trying to tear down, he's gonna be beyond good and evil. So he doesn't okay. wanna see things as being good or evil in that sense, in one sense of the, but yes, in fact, a number of uh, historians and philosophers uh, have argued that in fact, he did set up an alternative morality, mm. an aristocratic morality, mm. they sometimes refer to it as. But yeah, he's, he's uh, and so the Nazis were gonna, uh, were gonna like that idea about Nietzsche of destroying the weak, you know, being the strong and destroying the weak. Mm. In fact, they, the Nazis actually used the word to refer to other uh, people that they considered inferiors, but other, uh, they call them the Untermensch, which is the opposite of the Nietzschean Übermensch. Mm. Untermensch means un subhuman. Okay. Nietzsche's Übermensch is the superman or above human, yeah. overman sometimes it's translated. Okay. Now you said Nazi ideology drew on a whole host of different ideologies. Did, did Christian morality have any influence on Nazi ideology? That's an interesting question because not, Hitler tried to make it seem that way at times to try to play to the German public. So mm -hmm. there were certain kinds of uh, ways that Hitler tried to <coughs> show himself as the upholder of traditional morality, traditional family values, you know, these kinds of things were things that the Nazis were trying to play on. But he was doing it for entirely different reasons and purposes. And as I argue in, in some of my earlier books, uh, evolutionary ethics was really the key goal. So the goal was to improve human heredity, improve the Aryan race, improve the human species, uh, and whatever it took to get that way was legitimate in his view. So let's look at one particular example, I think, that illustrates this great abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, there's some uh, historians, German historians, who've written that, you know, the Nazis were pro-abortion and sort of, or we were, excuse me, were anti-abortion and sort of mm -hmm. used this as a, as a argument against uh, pro-life uh, yeah. groups even today. Mm -hmm. However, the Nazis weren't really anti-abortion. Mm -hmm. They were only opposed to abortion for healthy Aryan babies because they wanted okay. to improve, improve their, increase their population of okay. healthy Aryan babies. They were supportive of abortion and even forced abortion upon women with disabilities uh, and upon, uh, they encouraged abortion for Jews later on, and they encouraged abortion of Slavs once they began ruling over uh, parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, Slavic uh, peoples were uh, encouraged to get abortions. Mm -hmm. So they weren't pro-life in the way that Christians are pro-life, and they also weren't pro-family in the way that Christians are pro-family. During the war, uh, Himmler and uh, many of his associates were pushing in the S SS men to go out and father illegitimate children to you know, increase the German population. Uh, Hitler and Himmler actually talked about introducing polygamy after the war because so many men were dying in, in uh, World War II. And so there were a lot, to them, the goal was produce as many healthy Aryans as possible to improve the human species. And if that rides roughshod over Christian morality, so be it. Mm. Okay, so, so uh, moving now to how we think about this as, as Christians from a biblical perspective, how does a biblical understanding of, of anthropology and of ethics uh, better equip us to uh, be answering these questions about, about life than, uh, than the alternative of evolutionary ethics? Yeah. Christian ethics uh, and Christianity gives us a way of thinking about humanity in the world that, in my mind, is much truer to the reality that we face. So, for example, uh, Lawrence Krauss, a prominent uh, astrophysicist, uh, has said that love is just, the, uh, is just uh, neurochemical reactions. It's just uh, the firing of neurons. Mm -hmm. uh, and so 
uh, this is a very impoverished view of what love really is, whereas Christianity gives us a robust view of what love is. That, I mean, I don't think Lawrence Krauss actually uh, can, live that, can live that way when he's talking to his family and telling his wife, I love you. you know I, mean? I have a chemical reaction towards <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm just having a chemical I reaction right no now. My, neuron, my, yeah, my neurons are just firing in this way because I've been programmed by you know, antecedent uh, causation you know, to do that. And so uh, by... Uh, this uh, naturalistic view of ethics, it uh, robs us of who we are as humans. And again, I don't think that many of the naturalistic thinkers themselves uh, hew true to that in mm. many kinds of ways. And mm. one of the big examples that I give in my book, uh, Death of Humanity, is Bertrand Russell. Mm. Bertrand Russell is fascinating in this respect because on the one hand, he claimed that ethics and morality was just emotions. It's just all about feelings. So when you say, thou shalt not kill, what you really mean is, I just don't like killing. Mm. Uh, but on the other hand, he was a, a very passionate uh, supporter of uh, disarmament, nuclear disarmament, mm. even spent time in jail uh, for yeah. campaigning and protesting against it and such. Uh, and his, his daughter, Catherine Tate, wrote a book about him in which she said that he was an absolutist mm. in his morality. Okay. And I think that's true. Yeah. So I think there's ways that Christian ethics helps us to understand who we are much better than the secular ways which... Uh, they themselves, I think, realize that their own worldview doesn't make sense. And they're not prepared actually to live by it or, exactly. or to live out its, its consequences, whereas uh, with the Christian worldview, the, the opposite is, is true. We don't yeah. always live by our worldview either <clears throat> when we sin, for example, mm, sure. but we understand that within the context of our worldview, we understand that we're sinners. And so even though we're not living by our ethics you know, 100% of the time, at least we understand that that is moral failure uh, and uh, needs a remedy. Mm -hmm. How can we, just changing tack a bit, how can we restore dignity to mankind whilst rejecting the marginalization of God? Well, I think those two things there go hand in hand. Uh, and, and that's what I try to sketch out, in fact, in my book, Death of Humanity. I try to show that once you reject God, you end up rejecting any value of humanity. And so I think that the key is we need to get back to God. We need to return back to a vision where God is our creator, where we're created in the image of God, and that then gives value to humans. The uh, French philosopher Michel Foucault, who's one of the most famous philosophers of the late 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, argued forthrightly that Nietzsche's death of humanity, which he thoroughly agreed with, leads to the death of man. And so it's not just Christians saying this too. I mean, you'll, you may have heard Christians say this too, that you know, the, the death of God leads to the death of humanity. Mm -hmm. That's not just something Christians are saying. Secular philosophies are recognizing that too, although they're embracing it mm -hmm. very often so and, using it, and using it to promote uh, the devaluation of human life. Mm -hmm. So what, what cherished ideas and, and assumptions do we need most urgently to confront and deconstruct? What, what, are the, what are the dangerous ideas out there that are, that are threatening us in the early 21st century as a society? Yeah, well, in addition to sort of the way, things we've already sort of covered to some degree, I think really a couple key ideas that we're really wrestling with right now in our society is human inequality. Mm -hmm. And this, when I say that, that may not mean much to some people, but if you think about uh, in bioethics, what's called personhood theory, that yes, some humans are yeah. persons yeah. and some humans are not persons. Mm -hmm. And those humans that are defined as not persons are unequal and don't have the protection of the law mm -hmm. or in the protection of human rights and such. And what categories so, of people are you thinking about particularly? Do, what, if, you, usually when people are defining it that way, I mean like Peter Singer, for example, and but he's only one among many of the bioethicists mm -hmm. that's arguing these things, uh, is arguing that people who have rationality, mm -hmm. ability to plan the future, these are persons. Mm -hmm. And people who have... Uh, and, and by the way, they're very arbitrary too because they never really give any clear indication as to where that threshold is yes. that between persons and non-persons. Uh, but uh, well, people without, ra yeah. without rationality, so people who would be, uh, he would argue, Singer has argued that, in, that babies before they are born, certainly, and even after they're born for a while, mm -hmm. uh, don't have enough rationality to qualify as a person. And then people toward the end of their life or people who have mental disabilities would also, uh, in not, not uh, be persons in that kind of a view. So would Singer support not, not just euthanasia uh, and abortion, but also infanticide as well? Yes, he has. In fact, he's, he's, he's come up very, very forthrightly. And at one point, he actually gave it, said that the first 30 days, parents should be able to decide 
you know, he, that was pretty controversial. He's kind of backed off on that exact time frame mm -hmm. now, so he won't, he won't let you pin him down any longer. In fact, I, I debated Peter Singer mm -hmm. on uh, Unbelievable, Johnson Brierley's radio show out yeah. of London. And uh, Singer doesn't want to be pinned down on any time frame, which again, I find pretty problematic. I mean, because you're, you're saying this is not, a, you can't draw the line, can't distinguish when it be, actually becomes a person or whatever. But yeah, he did believe in infanticide. In fact, there's, a, there's an article that came out in the Journal of Medical Ethics just a couple of years ago uh, promoting post uh, birth abortion, mm -hmm. uh, and so or again, infanticide, yeah, infanticide. which is yeah, which which is infanticide, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and there was actually something of a blow up in it in the U.S. The U.S. Congress actually debated that article, uh, and there were some congressmen who were very strongly opposed to uh, that article. And the editor of the Journal of Medical Ethics, Julian Savalescu, uh, was basically responded by saying, "What's the big deal? Bioethics has been saying this for decades." Mm -hmm. You know, that people should be able to kill babies after. Uh, and, and they were actually using the logic of the pro-life movement, but then inverting it. And the logic was the baby just before it's born is not qualitatively different than the baby right after it's born. Mm -hmm. But instead of using the pro-life logic by saying, okay, then we shouldn't kill it before it's born, they inverted the logic by saying, okay, we kill them before they're born, so we can kill them after they're born. Yeah. I was just saying, there's a big difficulty if you've got that view of drawing the line because exactly. what degree of rationality or capacity for relationship or ability to communicate constitutes the threshold of personhood and what doesn't. And I, I guess that they probably don't all agree about when it happens either. No, they don't agree about when it happens. They also don't, don't agree about what the, what the characteristics are that would qualify a person to be a person. And okay. I, I pressed Singer on this in this yeah. debate that I did with him too. And I was astonished that he actually wouldn't justify mm. <laughs> which particular uh, traits were. So Singer usually talks about rationality and the ability to plan the future. Those are two of the big things that he okay. features a lot of times in his philosophy. But in, in this debate with him, I pointed out that Joseph Fletcher, who was one of the earliest personhood mm. theorists, back coming, going back to the 1950s, ethics, yeah, so, yeah, back in the 1950s, he was already uh, teaching uh, uh, that this personhood idea that some humans are persons and some are not. Mm. He had 15 different characteristics once that he listed as to what makes a human a person mm. uh, as opposed to a non-person. And so I asked Singer, you know, okay, so Fletcher has these 15 characteristics, you know, you have these several or whatever, you know, so, uh, you know, how do we know which of these characteristics really define personhood? And he said, well, we can discuss which characteristics. That, that's his response. Uh, mm. So they also can't figure out which characteristics. And by the way, th their privileging of rationality doesn't really fit their worldview either, because mm. if they're privileging rationality, that assumes that rationality has some value. But if rationality is itself just the product of cosmic accidents, mm -hmm. accidental mutations that have taken place that have led to our brain developing to where we have this rationality, rationality itself has no value. In the Christian worldview, we can understand why rationality has value. In the beginning was the logos. Mm -hmm. Logos mm -hmm. it comes from the Greek word that has to do with rationality, logic. We get the word logic from logos. Uh, so the, in the Christian worldview, rationality does have value, but it's not doesn't determine whether a human has value. Mm. A human has value because they're created in the image of God. And that's a, a great note to think, I think, to finish on. So thanks okay. very much, Richard. Thanks for having me. Yeah.